Okay, welcome everybody. This is just a funny tweet that I, I saw online. So debugging is like being a detective in a crime movie where you're also the murderer. So uh, that appealed to me, spent a lot of time debugging. Maybe it appeals to some of you too. Yeah, let's see. Okay, so we're, we were talking about uh, search algorithms for Milestone 3. And we started with one that is uh, useful. It's useful in general in graphs. It's not the best for Milestone 3, but it's a good place to start. And that was depth first search. And uh, we went through how, we went to develop the code. Uh, it's recursive code. It's related to what you did in a binary search tree, but a little different. Uh, you need this visited flag. And at the very end of last lecture, we had uh, finished our depth first search but we had to add in output. So to add in actually storing the path we found, we did it in you know not the smartest way. We basically just constructed the path as we were recursing and we passed that whole path around. So we kept adding edges into this path or street segments into this path and we kept passing it around as we recursed. And uh, when we find the destination ID, so at the end of our recursion, we're gonna find the destination ID and we used to just um, we used to just return true. Now what we're going to do is we're going to. I don't want to underline that. Now what we're going to do is we're going to somehow save this path. Okay, so we can call some other function and say, okay, before I return from the recursion, you need to save my path in some data structure, and that'll work. Okay, I'm not going to show you that code, but uh, we could do that. Uh, and yeah. Isidore in the chat is already offended by my code and you should be. So you've already seen that this code, basically this passing around the whole path all the time is not very good. Okay, it's not a very efficient way to do it, but it'll function. So let's analyze the complexity of what, of what we just did. Um, so we developed a step first search algorithm in a graph. Again, it's a lot like the binary search tree recursion that you wrote in ECE 244, but you need a visited flag to stop you from going around in circles. Um, graphs are big, so these city maps that you're working with have you know, more than 100,000 uh, intersections or nodes. Uh, sometimes they have more than a million. So what's the complexity of depth first search? And, uh, and I want the I'm going to special case this to in a street map. So in this course, we only really care about graphs that could correspond to city maps. Okay, so what, what do you think the complexity of depth first search is? Uh, and I'm gonna walk through this in another slide. Uh, okay, so I see Isidore is saying, if the number of edges per node is bounded at, at say four, which is typical for a city, then it's gonna be order n. And, and that's exactly right, okay? So let's analyze the complexity of this algorithm that we've written. So we've got a recursive algorithm and the best way to analyze this is to realize that no matter how this recursion proceeds, we can only call find path, a recursive function, once per node. And the reason is once we hit a node, we, we mark this visited flag on it to true. And once we've marked it to true, we'll basically never do any real work for it again. Um, we, we don't make any more recursive calls if a node has already been visited once. Uh, so you can see there's an if statement guarding the recursion here. So once we set a node to be visited, we will never call find path on that node again because we'll never go through this if statement. Okay, so that means we can only call find path uh, once per node. Uh, so that's order n. However, so, but we have to think of, well, how much work do we do in one call to this function then? So, and the work turns out to be constant. We have a loop here, so we have to look at this loop and say, hmm, how, you know, maybe that, maybe that loop is doing some function of n uh, work. Maybe it's growing as the street maps get bigger. But this loop goes through every outgoing edge of, a, of the current node. Okay, so the current node is some intersection. We're gonna go through all of the outgoing edges. So basically we're asking, what are all the adjacent intersections? You wrote this function in milestone one, find adjacent intersections. And the average number of adjacent intersections is not many. It's about four in a normally laid out uh, city. So we're going to go through this loop only about four times on average. And if you look through the loop, it's not doing all that much work, um, but it calls this find path. 
Okay. It's not doing much work except where we're basically adding a piece to the path that we found so far. So we add the latest edge, the latest straight segment to this path. So this path might be getting long. And then we pass it into find path right here. Okay, so that's going to involve a copy. So we're copying potentially a long path. So everything in this loop is order one, except this copy of the path. If the path gets long, then this, this could be more than order one. Okay. Um, so what's the complexity of that? So find path executes at most order n times because we have this visited flag. There's constant work in each call, except copying the path. Copying the path, okay, a simple bound on this is the path couldn't have more than the number of nodes in the, in the city, okay? So it couldn't traverse, we can only visit an intersection once, which means we can't have more than n uh, intersections in this path. And that's a pretty bad travel path. This means we're going through the whole city in our path. So that's a pretty easy bound. Um, path can't be more than order n. Um, but if it is order n, that means that every one of these calls to find path, and there are n of them, is copying a path with n nodes in it, which is order n work. So you multiply that out and get order n squared. So that's actually going to be really slow. When n is, you know, 100,000, a million, that's not good. Can you, you know, how often are you going to get a path that is uh, uh, n nodes? I'm not sure. So the average path will be somewhat shorter than that, but it's more complicated to, to analyze. So the average case may be a bit better than this, than this worst case, but the worst case is bad and the average case is not gonna be very good either. And we're not gonna bother trying to analyze that average case. We already know enough to say, well, it's not a very fast algorithm, okay? Um, but, you know, can we do better? So this algorithm was almost fast. It was almost fast until we, like order n is pretty good for a graph search algorithm. We're not gonna do better than that. Um, it was almost fast, but this copying of the path has really hurt us. So can we get rid of that? Okay, and uh, so yeah, is it saying we can do better, store the previous node in each node? Yeah, this isn't a very good way to store the path where basically um, every time we go to a new intersection, we pass, pass all the information of everything we've ever done before to get there. And we don't need to do that. We could just at every intersection store how did I get here? What is the previous intersection or even better, what is the uh, street segment or the edge I used to get here? If we do that, we essentially have enough information to reconstruct the path and it's much, much faster. Okay, so we're not gonna pass the whole path around. I just showed that as a simple, but don't do that solution. There are a bunch of ways that we could try to make this faster, but one way that works well and is pretty general is every node stores the edge that was used to reach it. So edge means street segment. Okay, and what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna basically in my node data structure, so I need some data for the algorithms that I'm creating. So I'm making uh, some data structure, maybe it's a vector, where I have some information for every single node. So in my node data structure, I'm gonna add a new member called reaching edge. Okay, reaching edge just is the ID of the street segment that I used to get there, um, or some other method that I used to store which edge was this. Okay, with this technique, I can reconstruct the path when I reach the destination. So it's like I left little post-it notes uh, on all of the intersections I was wandering through as I was wandering around downtown Toronto. At every intersection, I left a post-it note that just said one thing. You know, what is the street segment or city block that I should follow to get back to where I came from? And when I get, when I follow that street segment back to the intersection before, okay, so from this street segment, I have a little post-it note say, or intersection, I have a little post-it note saying, what street segment did I use to get here? Maybe it was Spadina. Okay, so I followed that and I have another little post-it note there saying, well, from here, we should take college for one block and so on. And I don't need to store the whole path. I just need to store my post-it note, one piece of information at every one of these intersections or notes. So that's what I'm going to do in code. That would be a pretty reasonable way to do this if I was actually wandering around Toronto. It also is a pretty reasonable way to do it in code. Okay. All right. If I do this, now the work per find path is order one because 
we already showed that we only go through that loop about four times. And aside from the copying of the path, everything was order one. Uh, setting a single uh, variable is also order one. Okay, so if I do that, the total complexity of this depth first search algorithm is order n, uh, which is fast. Okay, that's pretty good for a graph algorithm. Okay, so let me quickly show you what it looks like. And let's see. Okay, so. Okay, so here's uh, our reference solution. And over here, I can we can visualize the pathfinding algorithm, which actually you may want to do. You don't have to do this in Milestone 3, but it can be a useful technique to see what your algorithm is doing. So we basically uh, draw as the algorithm is exploring the graph, we actually draw what it's exploring. Okay, so I'm just going to click on an intersection and it's going to start finding a path. All right, and that one actually went pretty, what? Actually is updating less frequently, I guess, due to network lag. Okay, so it's still searching. It's actually searching continuously, but once in a while, uh, my Wi-Fi, I think, buffers things up. And you can see it's not very organized. Uh, it's wandering all over Toronto looking for the destination intersection. It hasn't found it yet. Okay, so it's not a very organized search. Uh, we're slowing it down. So I'm, I'm actually delaying the algorithm so you can actually see the graphics updates. Um, but yeah, you can see it. this recursive algorithm has no notion of am I getting closer or further. It searches through the whole city map in essentially a random order. Okay, so that doesn't look so great. Yeah, so this is like, you would be a very bad driver if you essentially have no overall plan. Like someone says, can you go from your house to campus? And you say, sure. And all you do is as you're driving at every intersection, you basically leave a dab of paint so that you make sure you never go to that intersection again. But otherwise you basically turn at random. You're just gonna explore every intersection in Toronto if you have to until you eventually find campus. So, uh, so that's not good. Okay, so that's that's been going on for a while. Um, let me stop that for a second because it still hasn't found the answer. Um, I'm going to show you a better algorithm. So uh, this is called breadth first search, and while we're here, I'll just demo it quickly. So if I click here, and that was actually so fast you didn't see it, so the animation is not quite as good over Zoom. Let me click there, maybe you'll see it. This is exploring in a more logical way. Okay, so hopefully now you can see the graphics updates. And it's still exploring. And hopefully there, it just found the path. Okay, so it found that red path and it found a path that takes 13 minutes between those two points. So I want to, I can zoom in to show what's going on better here. Okay, and maybe I'll draw this, I'll do one that's really close. It's right there, say. Oops, that's too close. Okay, so as you're a bit zoomed in, you can see a little more about how it's searching. Okay, so we're going to see, this is, looks a little more logical, okay? This is exploring intersections near where you started and kind of expanding outwards, trying to find the destination. And it hasn't found it yet, but you can see where it's exploring. And pretty soon, I think it's going to find where I clicked. And then you'll see the, the path. Um, so this doesn't look super fast right now. And actually, it isn't. We'll see ways to speed this up. Uh, but it does find a pretty reasonable path. This path took 24 minutes. Maybe it's not the best, but it's better than what we got with depth first search. Okay, so, and yeah, I see some people already guessing, you know, ways of coming up with ways to make this better. And you're right, you can definitely make this better. So let me shrink this down and get back to the uh, slides. Okay. Okay, so there are basically multiple problems with uh, depth first search. It's first one is that we're finding a path, not the shortest one. So um, in this little graph uh, that we looked at last week, we didn't find the shortest path, which would have been here. If all of the travel times on these edges are the same, we found this much more circuitous one. And that you, you saw how kind of disorganized depth first is. It just wanders around your graph. So it can find a very long path. Okay, so that's not great. Um, people don't want to get like really long travel routes. So you're going to get, and you get low marks for that, which you don't want. So how are we going to fix this? Um, so we're going to switch from uh, depth first search to a better algorithm called breadth first search. And I've seen various people in the chat talking about Dijkstra's algorithm. Dijkstra's algorithm is a small enhancement to breadth first search. So all these search algorithms kind of share, 
they build on each other. So depth first search and breadth first search are two classic graph, graph search algorithms. And Dijkstra's algorithm, which is better still than breadth first search, is a small enhancement to the uh, depth, breadth first search code. So I want to start with breadth first search. Okay, so depth first search was um, was not very organized, right? It just wandered recursively around our, our graph, has no real sense of direction, can find really long paths. So that's not great, okay? So a more orderly technique, well, I already showed you a demo of it. Um, but basically, if someone asked you to find a, a certain place, a certain uh, intersection, you're probably not gonna just start wandering at random. You'd probably take out a map and you'd search around where you are right now with your finger and you'd look at all the streets around you and see, well, am I close to it? Okay, and if you don't find it, then you might, with your finger again, search a little further out in the map and so on. You know, so you search outwards in probably waves until you found the destination. At least this is a better way to do it. It's much better than depth first search. So, and then once you find the destination, you can, you can follow those reaching edges that we talked about and, uh, and uh, come up with the path backwards. Okay, so how do we code that? That's, this is basically what breadth first does, breadth first search does. It essentially expands outwards in circles in, in the graph. So it looks at the things that are really close to the source, then it looks at the things that are close to those and so on in essentially waves until it hits the destination. Once it hits the destination, it calls another routine that you've written to figure out, well, how did I get here? Okay, so what does breadth first search look like? Um, I'm gonna start at my source. So that's at zero hops away. Then I'm gonna look at all the nodes I can reach by following just one edge. So one hop away. Then I'm gonna look at all the nodes that I can reach by following two edges. So two hops away and three hops away and so on. That's what that expanding outwards in circles means. Okay, so how would I code that? Um, well, here's some pseudo code for that. So I can use my get node by ID function. So I've got some source ID. Uh, I use that source ID to look up uh, a pointer to a data structure I have where there's an entry for every node. So I can store some extra data. So maybe this is a pointer, maybe it's an entry in a vector, doesn't matter. Uh, and then I'm gonna call a new routine, breadth first search path where I pass in this source node and the destination ID. Okay, so that's just a little bit of setup code. That's not super interesting. Um, the more interesting function is, well, what does this breadth first search path actually do? So I'm passing in the ID of a destination and you know, I could use IDs. I'm using pointers here. There are different ways to code this. So a pointer to my source node. Uh, so I can store some extra data around there. Okay, so what does it look like? Okay, so I need some extra data. With depth first search, we didn't need to store much. We needed a visited flag to uh, avoid going in circles. But other than that, we could just recurse. We just kept recursing to see what nodes can I reach next? Let's call this function again on them. Breadth first search doesn't use recursion, okay? It uses uh, iteration. It needs to keep track of what to do next. And it needs an actual data structure to do that. So I'm gonna call that a wavefront. That's a common name for this. And the wavefront stores, what are, what's my to-do list? What are the nodes that I wanna explore next? I haven't looked at them yet. I haven't checked if they're my destination, but I know they're the next set of nodes in, those, in, in the next circle, essentially, the next level that I wanna go look at. Okay, so um, I'm gonna start my wavefront with it's empty, okay? So there's nothing in my wavefront. And that's what I did here. And I see there's a question, why am I using a list instead of a queue? Uh, it's basically because everybody in the class should be familiar with what a list is, and they may not be familiar with what STLQ is. So some of us are just trying to keep the, the code simple and understandable. Um, okay, so I've created an empty list. That's what this line does. So my wavefront starts out empty. And then I insert the source node into it. So I'm going to push the source node into it. Um, so that's what I'm showing down here in this animation. My wavefront now has the source node, which is ID zero. And then the main loop of breadth first search is while this wavefront isn't empty, 
we check, we take something out of the wavefront. We take the first entry out of the wavefront. Okay, so we take the front node. And in this case, there's only one thing in the wavefront. So the front node is node zero, my source. Um, in a list, if I wanna get rid of that node, so I wanna take it out of my wavefront, I have to call another function, pop front. So these two things together, get the node at the front of the list and then remove it. So I now know that I'm looking at node zero. Okay, that's my current node. And I've taken it out of the wavefront. The wavefront's empty. Okay, now what do I do? So the I check its ID to see am I at the destination. If I'm at the destination, then I'm done. I found it. If I'm not at the destination, well, what should I do? Okay. So if I'm not at the destination, what I want to do is look at the outgoing edges again. So I'm at this, this node, I need to look at where can I go next, the next level. Okay, so I look through all of the outgoing edges of this current node. And so what are those outgoing edges? They're street segments. So you, you can look at the street segments. It's basically, your, this is your find adjacent intersections uh, code. Look at all the street segments that can actually let you go to another intersection after you can account for one ways and so on. So for all of those outgoing edges, you wanna go and get the node at the other side. So in this case, that would be node one, um, the first time through the loop. And we put that node into our wavefront. So we look at node one, we put it in the wavefront. And then we look at the other edge, it goes to node two, so we put that in our wavefront. Okay, so we checked, are we at the destination? We aren't. So we go through all of our outgoing edges and all we do is we put them in our wavefront. We put them in our to-do list. And then we go around to the top of the loop again, okay? So at the top of the loop, we're gonna take the next thing out of the wavefront. Okay, and the next thing out of the wavefront is gonna be this node one, okay? That's at the front of my wavefront. So I'm gonna to go to node one, that's my new current node. I check, is that my destination? It isn't. I'm gonna look at the edges going out of it, that's that. Uh, and that edge gets to node three. So I put node three in my wavefront. Okay, and then I'm done. There are no more edges in that uh, that node. I go back here, to the top of the while loop, take the next thing out of my wavefront, which is node two. So I go over here. It's not my destination. I look at the edges it can reach uh, or the nodes that can, I can get to, three and four, I put them in my wavefront. Okay, next thing in my wavefront was node three. I take it out. So that becomes my current node. I'm going again through this while loop. Uh, so I'm back at the top of my while loop. It's not my destination. I look at what I can reach. I can reach this. So I'm going to put that in my wavefront. Okay. Uh, and so on. So I actually will go over here. That node four is the next thing in my wavefront. Uh, I'll actually go back to node three and look at it again. And finally, node five is the front of my wavefront. I take it out. That's my destination. Okay. So it works. I found my destination. If I ever get down here, so I finish this while loop, it means no path exists. I went through all the edges that I could get to, all the nodes that I could reach in this kind of uh, iterative expansion, this kind of wavefront expansion, and I never found the destination. In that case, I'm going to return false because it means there is no path. Okay. Uh, does this make sense? I take I can't see anyone's face so I uh, I'm gonna take that as uh see one person says yes so thank you so at least one person is following me okay now we, we kind of what do I know when I get here with the code I just wrote it's going to return true or false there is a path or there isn't when I get to the destination what do I actually know How do I get to campus? Well, you know that there is a way to get to campus. Yeah. So how do I get to campus? And you know, yes, you know that it is possible to get to campus. So we got the same problem we had with depth first search. We've written an algorithm that tells us there is a path or there isn't, but it doesn't actually remember enough to tell us what the path is. Okay. So we're going to use the technique that we talked about for depth first search. It's the same one. Uh, it's called backtracing. So the general idea, once again, is at every node, which is an intersection, we store the edge, which is a street segment, that got you there. Uh, when you reach the destination, you're going to follow those stored edges or street segments to get back to the source. 
and that's going to create our path. And basically, when you make your data structures, there's basically two ways you can you can make your data structures. You could go in load map and actually load a graph. So you could make a graph where you talk about nodes and you talk about edges. Um, so it looks just like what I showed you here. Uh, and then you can work with the that graph. You can also just work directly with the functions that you wrote in M1 and the functions we've given you in uh, Streets database, because essentially those functions are working with the street map as a graph anyway. So if you prefer, you can directly just code things in terms of intersections and in terms of street segments and, and call functions like find adjacent intersections that you've already written. Uh, and that's fine too. Okay. So in the examples I'm giving, I'm generally just speaking about a graph, but if you don't want to make an explicit graph data structure, it's perfectly fine to just code it with intersections and street segments using the uh, functions you've already created. Okay. Okay, so how do I print out the path? So we're gonna use that technique of every node should remember, how did I get here? So what edge was used to reach me or what street segment was used to reach me? In order to do that, I need to store some more information and I need to actually store it in two places. First, the, the wave front, that's my to-do list. Okay, so back here, let's look at my wave front. My wave front was just a list of pointers to nodes. Okay, so it just stored node IDs or node pointers. That was all I needed. Now that I actually want to know how to get back, I need my wavefront to store a bit more. Okay. It still needs to store, you know, the ID of the intersection or a pointer to the node, some way to get at my uh, a piece of to get at that node and the data associated with it. But I also want to store how did I get here? And one way I can do that is I could just store an edge ID. So this might be the street segment ID, for example. And and it's the ID of whatever street segment or edge I use to reach that node. Um, and just to make my code a little shorter, I'm going to define a simple constructor. So a constructor that just takes, you know, this node pointer and this edge ID, and it creates a wave element with those two things set. So that's just a little convenience function. I also need to know when I don't have a previous edge. So basically I need to know where I'm going to try to reconstruct paths. So I'm going to wind up at a certain node, say this one, and I'm going to look through this data structure to see what was the uh, edge ID that I used to get here. Okay. It's also going to be important that I can store while well, I'm the start of the path. Okay. Maybe I'm the first node. So there is no edge to me. I'm the end. I'm the start intersection. So I'm going to define a special value. No edge is going to be negative one. Um, and whenever you do something like this, you want to make it a constant. So I'm going to do it with a define. That's one way to make a constant and you want to comment what it is. So this means there it's illegal. There is no edge. Uh, if you get a wave element like this, it means this was the starting point of the path. And it's important that this value be illegal. So I know that if these edge IDs correspond to street segment IDs, that they can never be negative. So in that case, this negative one is a special value that will never occur for any uh, edge ID or street segment ID. Okay. Um, so that was wave element. I also, and wave element is remember my to-do list. These are nodes or intersections that I want to look at next, but I haven't looked at. And I've added a little bit of extra information. The edge ID I used to get to that node. That's not enough because after I take things out of the wavefront, uh, if you look at this code back here, let's go back quickly. I take things out of the wavefront and, and then I do a bunch more work. Okay. So it's not enough just to have information in the wavefront about how I got somewhere. I also need to remember it uh, on every node in the graph as I'm exploring. So I also add a little bit of extra information. Um, I'm going to again use an integer ID. We'll call it reaching edge. So it's the ID of the of the edge or the street segment that we use to reach this node. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's see how that works in practice. So I had to add some data to my data structures. How am I going to use this? Well, I'm just showing you the 
changes in the code. So the code looks pretty similar to what I had before, but before I just had a list of, you know, node pointers or node IDs, either one's fine. Uh, now I'm going to have a list of wave elements, this new little bit bigger data structure that I've created. And when I put things into the wave front, I'm going to put in, you know, there are two elements to a wave element, the thing that's in this wave front. There's the node ID or the node pointer. You can code it either way. And there's the ID or some other identifier. Well, some identifier of the edge I used to get there, the street segment I used to get there. So to start with, I'm going to say my wave front has only the source node, which in this example is node zero. And the ID of the edge or the street segment I used to get there is is no edge, okay? The illegal flag that says there's nothing before this. This is the start of my path, okay? The rest of this code, again, it's only the blue things that are changes. So while the wavefront isn't empty, I take whatever is at the front of the wavefront out um, and remove it, okay? So that's what I'm doing there. So let's let's see what that code would do. So it would take out uh, node zero and it stores on my node data structure, okay, what this reaching edge is, okay? So I'm gonna store that for this node, node zero, the edge I used to get there is this illegal value. There is no edge used to get there. You're the start of the path, okay? So that's what this code is doing. There's lots of ways you can code this, you know, you can code this using vectors and so on. But the basic idea is you've got some data for every single node and it's got a data member called reaching edge. And I'm going to set it to whatever came off the wavefront. The wavefront told me what edge I used to, to get here. I want to keep track of that on this node. Okay, this code's the same. Check if I'm at the destination. If I'm not, if I'm at the destination, I'm done. If I'm not at the destination, then I basically just look at all of the uh, things that I can reach from the destination or from the current node. In this case, it would be these two uh, nodes. And I'm going to put them in my wavefront. And putting them in the wavefront, again, I put in a couple of pieces of information. I put in what is the uh, node ID and what is the edge we used. So I, in this case, I've labeled the edges with letters and I've numbered the nodes with uh, integers. Okay, so, so when I go through this loop, um, for the first time, what's going to happen is I'm going to put node one in and node two into my wavefront. And in both cases, I'm going to store what edge does I use to get them to get there. So I used A to get to node one and I used B to get to node two. Okay, um, now I go back through my loop. So I come up here again and I'm going to pull something out of my wavefront. So I pull this one A out. That's at the front of my wavefront. And I'm going to go look at it. It's not my destination. So I'm going to go into this uh, loop that looks at its outgoing edges, the intersections that it can reach. And the intersections uh, it can reach, it can only reach one. Can it reach intersection three and it can reach it with edge E. So I put that in my wavefront and keep going, okay? So I would go through and walk through this whole uh, graph again the exact same way I did before. And eventually I reach my destination. So we already saw this. The only difference is now when I reach my destination, for every node, so I have, say, a vector of information for every node or for every intersection, I have this information. I have this reaching edge. So I know I'm at node 5, and I can look up node 5's reaching edge, and it's F. And from that reaching edge, I can say, okay, well, that was, that was the edge that I used. So I go back and look at where that takes me. It takes me here. I can look at the reaching edge for that, it's D. So I can say, okay, this is the edge I took to get there. So I can go back along that edge and I can see, okay, at this node, what was the reaching edge? It was B, so I should follow that one back. And that takes me to my source. And that node says I have no previous edge. So I've now found the path by basically tracking back through these reaching edge uh, information. Okay, so so I just did that by hand. Um, how am I going to do it in code? Well, the way you do it in breadth first search is first you find the path. So I just showed you the code to find a path using breadth first search. 
And it's left these breadcrumbs. It's left these reaching edges stored on all the nodes. And then I can just find it, I can reconstruct the path with another function call. So if I found a path, I'm going to, for milestone three, we ask you to return the path as a vector of street segments. So a vector of edges or a vector of street segments means basically the same thing. I need to get that by calling some routine that can do just what, do what I just did by hand, right? I followed backwards through these reaching edges to figure out my path. I need to write that routine. I'm gonna call it breadth for search traceback. Okay, so uh, there it is. And it needs to know the destination ID, it needs to know where to start. And this traceback doesn't start at the source. So it doesn't start at the, the starting intersection. It starts at the end, it starts at the destination intersection. Okay, so what, what is this going to look like? Um, this might be hard to do without being in class. If anyone's got an idea of what this code should look like, um, maybe this is too hard to do over, over Zoom. Maybe I'll just show you. Okay, so the way I'm going to do this, there are a few ways, but I'm going to make a list of edges or street segments. So I'm going to make an empty list to start with. Uh, the reason a list is a bit convenient, it's not the only way I can do this, is as I'm going backwards, I'd like to actually insert data at the front of this path. Um, and that's going to give me a nice in-order path at the end. Okay, so I make an empty path. So my code starts off, there's nothing in the path. This was the default constructor. Um, I need to get to this destination. So I'm saying I've got some code that given a destination ID, it can go and get the uh, data associated with that, that node. Okay, so I get node by ID and I get a pointer to its data. Um, I could also, probably an even better way to store this is to store it in a vector and just look up the entry uh, in the vector uh, that corresponds to destination ID. It's probably better than using pointers. Uh, but it's basically equivalent. That's like a low-level coding detail. Okay, so I'm at this node now, and I can look at all of its data. And in at this node, I, I made this data structure. So I said the node data structure for every single node has an element called reaching edge. And I made sure my breadth first search routine set it as it was doing the search. So I say, okay, my previous edge is equal to whatever stored on this node as its reaching edge. So the previous edge in this case is F. And now I'm going to have to loop. I don't know how many levels there might be in this path. I'm going to have to go for a while, so I'm going to need a loop. So, and I'm going to keep looping until I reach the source. And the way I'm going to tell that I've reached the, the starting intersection or the source is that there's no the previous edge, right, how I got here, becomes equal to my sentinel value, no edge. Okay, so that's my exit for the loop. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, I know that this path to get to the destination should have a street segment F in it, edge F in it. So I'm going to push that into the front of my path. Okay, so that's now in my path. Um, but that's not the whole path. I now need to keep going. The way I keep going is I'm going to follow this edge or this street segment to find the intersection at the other end. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to say, what was the edge that was used to reach that node, which I can do. Every node knows what this reaching edge was. We stored it already uh, in our breadth first search routine. So in this case, that would be D and once we set up these two variables, we're ready to go through the loop again. So we just uh, go through this while loop again. And um, every time we go through this while loop, we basically, uh, we basically add another edge into the front of our path. Okay, so we push this edge D in, we go through the while loop again, we'll wind up at this node, we'll see that we reached it through node uh, edge B. So we'll push in edge B into our uh, path and then we'll wind up at the source. It doesn't actually have any reaching edge. So that when we get to this node at the source, this reaching edge is gonna be the special value of no edge, negative one. And we're gonna drop out of this loop because we're testing for that. And at that point we have the whole path. 
Okay, the path was edge F, edge D, edge B. And the reason we're actually pushing all of these things into the front of the path, instead of put using push back, is this makes it come out in the right order, right? So we wind up with edge B first, because that's the first thing we follow, edge D second, because that's the second, and edge F third, because that was the third one. So that was why I actually chose to use a list here, because list, you can actually push things into both the front and the back. In this case, it was convenient for me to push things into the front so that the path comes out in the right order, because in uh, milestone three, you're supposed to give a path and travel directions from the starting point to the destination, not in the opposite order. Okay, so a list made it easy for me to put it in the right order. Um, now the milestone three unit tests and the header file that you have to match say that you're not to return a, a list, you're supposed to return a vector. But I can just write a function to, to make a uh, vector out of a list. So I can do that. Uh, if I really don't like lists, I could have also written this whole thing with a vector. And the vector vectors don't have push front. So I would have wound up with using push back and I would have gotten the path in the wrong order. But at the end, I could have just called a, written a reverse function and I could have put it in the right order. So that would work fine. But basically, I, I got the path. It's not in the right data structure, but that's fine. I'll just call something to put it in the right data structure. And there's lots of different ways you can do this. Okay. Uh, and yeah, so both Truman and Isidore have noted that you, you know, you could just use standard reverse instead and put this in a vector. So I could have done that as well. So I could have used a vector and then just reverse it at the end. Okay, so you're going to need a traceback routine like this. So as I said, you're, we're going to get to even faster algorithms like Dijkstra's algorithm, but Dijkstra's algorithm is basically a small enhancement to breadth first search. So you're going to use something very much like this to do your traceback. Okay, um, let's see if this, this works well. So it worked on our, our sample case before, but let's put some travel times on these, these edges. So these travel times now correspond to street segments. Okay, let's just walk through. We start at this source. So our wavefront would be just node zero. And we're going to look at the nodes that it can reach, which are one and two. Those are the ones directly connected to it. So those go into our wavefront. We're going to look at, um, as we pull these off the wavefront, we're going to uh, take whatever they can reach and put them back in the wavefront. Okay, so we take off node one and we'll add node three. Okay, next thing that can come off our wavefront is node two. So we're going to go over here, look at node two. And as we're doing this, we're storing what was the edge we used to get here. I'm not showing the edges in the wavefront, but we put them in there too. I'm just showing them stored on the nodes. Okay, so every node remembers how did you get to me? What is the edge used to reach me? Okay, so this, we keep doing this with this wavefront. So uh, we look at node three, that's the next thing in our wavefront. So we go down here and we'll record that we got there through edge D. Um, and we put, well, we, one of the things we could get to is four. So we put that into our, uh, wavefront. Now we pull the next thing out, which is actually node one. Okay. So we pull node one out and this is actually important. When we pulled node one out this time, node one, the first time we reached it, we reached it through edge a. Okay. So it's reaching edge has been set to a, but node one is in the, still in the wavefront because we also reached it through another path coming this way. Okay, so now we're pulling node one out of the wavefront for the second time. We pull it out, and this time we reached it through edge C because we're coming through this path. So we update its reaching edge, um, and, and we keep going. We're still not the destination. We're gonna put node, we're gonna see that node three is reachable from, from node one, so it's gonna go in the wavefront. Finally, node four, which is our destination, is at the front of the wavefront. We take it out. We find the destination. Uh, it is the destination. So we break out of our while loop. We're done. We're going to invoke that traceback routine to find how we got here. And it's going to trace back, you know, edge by edge. So it's going to say, well, you got here through edge E, then edge D, then edge C, right? So we can't, the reaching edge is C. So we're going to go back this way, then edge B, and we're going to get to the source. So that's actually the path we find, okay? Um, and that is not the best travel time. 
this is actually a travel time of um let's see so the travel time is 19 seconds and the travel time through here would have been 14 seconds on this path this path so we still didn't get the best path okay so what happened so i kind of showed you what happened but maybe if anyone can type in the chat what happened they'll see if you're kind of following along what was what's the flaw in the algorithm um this is breadth first search but there's something that i did that's not ideal for uh shortest path algorithms yeah we just keep we didn't save a cost we keep the latest path so basically we found a good path here but then we let the algorithm later on overwrite it with a better path with a worse path here right we found this node again and we updated its reaching edge we didn't do any checks to see is that actually a good idea was that better um so so that's what happened we overwrote its data and we actually when we traced back we still found a path but it's not as good so we don't want to do that okay so node one was re-expanded uh it overwrote this reaching edge and that messed up the path trace back. So we don't want to do that. Okay, so what's the solution to that? Um, so the solution to that is already, you basically mentioned it. There are a couple solutions, but the most straightforward one is to actually remember, is this the smallest cost I've ever gotten to this node or not? Okay, so if we store, put a little more data now in our node data structure, so you're going to want to have, you know, a struct storing some information for every intersection or every node so you can just add data to it so i now want to add another piece of data what's the shortest travel time from the source to a certain node okay so every node has its own entry in a vector say um, so that it has its own data structure and it can store its own best time that i've ever seen to get to me okay and then we should only process a node if the shortest travel time to it has dropped. Um, otherwise, we should just skip it. Okay, so if we make that change and we walk through this algorithm, it's going to do almost the same thing, right? It's going to use this wavefront. We're going to walk through. We're going to update these reaching edges. But we're now updating not just the reaching edge, like how did we get here? We're also storing what was the total travel time to get here. So we, let me go a little slower here. Okay, we start at this source and we put in the wavefront the two nodes that we'd be able to get to, one and two, okay, by looking at the outgoing uh, street segments or edges. And then we pull out node one from the wavefront. We store that we got there through edge A and we store that we got there with a travel time of five seconds. Um, we look at node B or node two, and we do the same thing. But we're always storing the travel time. So we came through edge B, and we have a total travel time of five seconds. Okay, and let's see. We go down here, we'll store at node D that we got here through, uh, sorry, node three that we got here through edge D in 11 seconds. And you can see that node three, again, is it's in our wavefront still, right? We found node three um using a well we found node one using a second uh method right so node one comes up again from our wavefront uh, but this time we know that the path is we we used edge c and the total travel time is 10 seconds uh, so we're going to have some code that basically says if that travel time is worse than what we currently have, which is five seconds, don't do anything. Okay, so we won't update its reaching edge. We won't update its travel time. We'll just skip over it. Keep going through the wavefront. We'll eventually find the destination. And now when we evoke the, tra the trace back, it actually finds the min travel time. So it'll find uh, 14 seconds and it will follow all the right edges. Okay. Um, and yeah, so I see lots of interesting comments in the chat. So this fixes it, okay? We have fixed breadth for search. It will now find the minimum travel time. So that's good. Um, and let's quickly look at what we just did. People have already figured out, like, this is, this is a fix. Um, but uh, you think maybe there are more clever ways to do it. And there are. 
Uh, but let's look at what this fix does first. So we need to store more data. So our wave element uh, stored the, the pointer to the node data structure or its ID, whatever you want. Uh, the ID of the edge that we used to get there or street segment used to get there. And now we've got a new thing, the travel time. What is the travel time from the source to this node um, that we're considering? Okay, just for convenience, I'm basically making a little constructor here because it makes the rest of the code shorter, but the constructor is simple. It just sets those three elements. Okay, it's not enough to add data to the wave elements. So the wave front, because the wave front's just kind of our to-do list. What are we gonna do next? We also need to add data to the node data structure so we can remember it for every intersection um, for a longer period of time throughout the path search. So we already had this reaching edge. How did I get here? Uh, now we're gonna add in another number, the best time. So best time is what is the shortest time we've, we've found to this node so far? Okay. All right, so that, that's what we need to add to our data structures. So we need to add this travel time to the wave element, and we need to also remember the best travel time to any node in our node data structure. And then I'm going to stop in a slide, but let me go one minute over. What do, what do we do in the code? Well, the code doesn't change much. Basically, we now, when we take something out of the wavefront, which we do right here, so we take something out of our to-do list, and the first thing we do is we check, is the travel time uh, that we're proposing, you know, we took this, this node out of our to-do list, our wavefront, and it's got a certain travel time, is that actually better than, than any previous travel time we found to that same node? If it is, then let's go do all the work, right? Let's, let's uh, update everything and look at all of the uh, nodes that we can reach from this one and so on. But if it's not, then just skip it all, okay? So this if statement is going to stop us from essentially putting worse uh, path, paths to a node into our solution. Okay, if it is a better one, we do some bookkeeping. So we remember, well, how did I get here? And what is this? We now found a new best time. So let's store that on the node. And, and that's basically it. And then when we, whenever we put something in the wavefront, we pass in a little bit of extra information. We've already been passing in uh, what node are we talking about in our wavefront? How did we get there? So what edge did we use to get there? And now we're also passing in what is the total time Okay, so we're at a certain node here, and we're proposing to put this certain node in the wavefront. Okay, so that's our wave element. And we need to pass, put, mark on this, what's the total time to it. Uh, and that's what this, this is computing here. It was whatever the time was to this node, plus whatever time we're adding um, by putting this new edge in. And, and that's it. With those changes, breadth first search will now find optimal pass, the minimum travel time. Okay, um, and and I'm going to read uh, Daniel's comment afterwards to see if uh, uh, if that's correct. That's it for today. Um, so we'll we'll look at the complexity of this uh, tomorrow, and and you're going to see that. I mean, I guess I'm giving a spoiler here by showing it to you. Uh, the complexity is not fantastic, and but with a small enhancement, which leads us to become something called Dijkstra's algorithm, the complexity gets much better. Okay, so uh, we're almost at Dijkstra's algorithm. Uh, we'll get there at the start of next lecture. Okay, thanks everybody.